<clears throat> well, good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. May I remind everyone to turn electrical devices to silent or turn them off if they're likely to interfere with the sound system. Um, I have apologies from committee member Jackie Bailey and the first item on the agenda for the committee is item one which is a decision by the committee to take item three in private and also uh, whether the committee's consideration of the draft report on the gender pay gap and the approach to the data inquiry should be taken in private at f future meetings. Are we agreed on yes, that? Yes. Thank you. Um, we'll now come to our first set of witnesses this morning. And uh, we have on our panel today Carol Buxton, uh, going from my left to right, who is Director of Regional Development, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. So welcome to you. Um, then we have Lynn Cadenhead, who is the Chairman of Women's Enterprise Scotland. Again, good morning and welcome. Then we have Linda Murray, who is the Head of Strategy at Scottish Enterprise, and Elma Murray, Chief Executive of North Ayrshire Council and a member, I think, here to represent the Scottish Local Authorities Economic Development Group. So welcome to both of you as well. And um, just by way of introduction, it might be helpful for committee members and those listening in for each of you just to indicate what your position is and your role uh, very briefly before we move on to questions from the committee members. So perhaps you could start with Carol Buxton. Thank you. Well, I'm Director of Regional Development with HIE. And within my portfolio, I um, work with policymakers in, within High, particularly around about young people, how to attract and retain young people, um, and how we deal with inclusive growth across the Highlands and Islands. I'm Lynn Cadenhead. I'm an entrepreneur and been involved in a number of uh, entrepreneurial companies in the startup scene in Scotland for a number of years, both in retail and technology. I'm here today with my uh, Women's Enterprise Scotland chairman hat on, and we are responsible for creating a conducive environment for women-led businesses to start up and grow in Scotland. I'm also chair of UNICEF in Scotland, so very interested in gender issues uh, in children, and I am also very interested in governance and have been involved in setting up a leadership and board governance course at Edinburgh Napier University recently. Uh, I'm Head of Strategy Services, Linda Murray at Scottish Enterprise. Uh, that job means I get to do lots of things, so I guess a generalist rather than a specialist in anything in particular. I've been with Scottish Enterprise uh, quite a long time and in previous roles I've particularly focused on uh, leadership and organisational development in companies. Um, I have a particular interest in youth employment and I currently champion uh, the Inclusive Growth Group in Scottish Enterprise and also the Brexit Response Group. Good morning and thank you for your time this morning. I'm Elma Murray, I'm the Chief Executive of North Ayrshire Council and as a member of the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives, I have the lead role for employability. That's not specifically why I'm here today because today I'm here representing colleagues from the Scottish Local Authority Economic Development Group who are my, uh, I guess, my, my colleagues that, that focus specifically on economic development in local government. And I'm very keen to share our experiences and the role for local government in um, helping women to advance and dealing with issues around the gender pay gap. One of the other um, matters that I've had the privilege of taking a lead role on over the last year is in conjunction with Deputy Chief Constable Rose Fitzpatrick, we have created the Scottish Women in Public Service Leadership Group, which is designed to promote and support women in, the pub in public services to take on greater leadership roles. Thank you. Um, we'll start with some questions from Bill Bowman. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, a couple of questions to begin with on statistics or around statistics. Uh, I think the first one you might have made some comment on in written submissions, but just to hear your, your views. And this is a question we ask all of the, all of the panels. Are the panel confident that there, are, there is a definitive set of statistics within Scotland on pay, earnings and employment for women? And the second question is, are any statistics available on those FDI projects supported by the enterprise agencies in terms of gender pay gaps, board compositions and management structures? Um, Carl Buxton. Okay. Um, 
I think obviously there are a lot of statistics available on the gender pay gap within Scotland. However, I do feel, you know, we, we talk about whether the mean or the median is the best one. I think there are pros and cons of, of both. I think for, for us, we feel in particular that not including part-time um, workers within the, the statistical definitions is a bit of a, a challenge given that we have over half of, of women in the Highlands and Islands work part-time, so really we're missing a very big chunk of the population there. So I think, um, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the current measurements and the statistics that are available, but I feel we could expand on those to give, a, a, give us a better picture overall. In terms of um, foreign direct investment, I'm, I don't have statistics um, in relation to our FDI specifically, but if the committee um, would, would like, I could try and see if we have any of those available and provide them later on. Yes, um, I should also have said to panel members, if uh, any of you wish to submit something further in writing after today's session, then the committee would welcome that. If there are issues that are raised that you want to come back in more detail on, then please do so, and that may be... Uh, the first example of um, that. Um, who else on the panel would like to comment on this? Perhaps it makes sense for me to come straight after Carol. Um, it, like Carol on that last piece on FDI statistics, it's, it's not something that I have uh, to hand today, but we can certainly have a look at that and come back to you on FDI statistics around a uh, gender pay gap, board composition and, and kind of general structure in the companies. Um, I think more generally on that question about do we have a, a kind of definitive set of statistics, I think um, there's probably a lot of statistics. The challenge that we might have here in Scotland is about the comparability of those statistics and whether or not all the data that we have available actually really helps us make some decisions and choices about what we want to do. Um, certainly my experience not being a statistician or an economist um, is that quite often you can look at the numbers and you think the number tells you one thing, but actually when you dig underneath it, it's telling you something quite different. So I think for me it's about uh, greater transparency and how we can make that comparable. Um, Alma Murray. Thank you, convener. Um, not so much from the private sector point of view, but I think the public sector is a very large employer in Scotland, and it's probably worthwhile considering what statistics we have there. Local authorities particularly have a range of statistics that they have to publish annually through their statutory performance indicators. Um, but again, like similar to the point that Linda was making, um, there are a whole range of, of bits of information that it would be helpful to dig under. So um, I could, for example, give you information about the proportion of employees that are male or female and at what grades they are within my organisation. But what's important then is to dig below that to look at how many are part-time, how many are full-time, and um, what the, the earnings there, or what the average earnings there for work out to actually get a real understanding of the pay gap. Um, my expertise is in the, the startup area, so I don't have any relevant information as to public sector or, or their organisations. But I would say, in general, my understanding is, and the short answer to that is no, there is a significant dearth of appropriate statistics um, that we need. In particular, we have um, scant information as to uh, the gender pay gap between men and women who are starting up our businesses. But there is a general perception that the gender pay gap in startup businesses persists at around 20% for female entrepreneurs and women-led businesses. My understanding is also that there are quite a lot of gender disaggregated statistics in some area, but unfortunately, they are not published. And if they don't publish them, they are they remain unrecognised. Lynn Cadenhead, when you're talking about the pay gap in startups, is that the actual entrepreneur or the people working in the um, in the enterprises? Again, it's very difficult to be definitive because there is so little information, but the information we have relates to female entrepreneurs who start up their business. In general, they pay themselves 20% less than a male entrepreneur who starts up their business. So even when they write their own paycheck, they still pay themselves less. Okay. Okay. Just on that last point, do you, do you have an idea why that would be? or? How? 
it's about the approach that female entrepreneurs take a different approach to their business, so they have a much more sustainable outlook towards their business. They are less interested in rapid scale-up and aggressive growth. They are more interested in looking after the, the, the people and reinvesting the money that they, they create into their businesses. So if there's an issue in the business, a female entrepreneur will tend to pay herself last and pay herself le less in order that she can sustain the businesses, whereas it tends to be the other way around for male-led businesses. Gil Patterson. On from that question, is there any statistics that would suggest that businesses that are started by women last longer than businesses that, that are started up by men? Yeah, there's quite a lot of information that shows that women take a very different approach to growing their business. They're sustainable. We've recently done a report um, for, for the Scottish Government. We've got about 50 references to documentations, and there's quite a lot of information uh, to, to reference that. So we can, we can give the details of that afterwards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, a question from Gordon MacDonald. Um, the gender pay gap uh, regulation came into effect on the 6th of April. Uh, what are the panel's views on the pay gap reporting legislation? Um, <clears throat> obviously, the, the public, we have a, a duty as a public sector organisation to, to publish our gender pay gap, which, which we do. In terms of the, the private sector, um, the, the number of employees currently who have the, the size of company that has to report is probably for our region in the Highlands and Islands, we probably have a relatively small number of businesses in that category. So I think it would be potentially worth exploring how what, what a sensible level might be or a, a, a level that would give a, a more, um, well, a, a better feel across the, the whole of Scotland as to what that gender pay gap might be rather than just for the the largest companies. Anybody else want to come in on that? Yeah, yeah, no. Actually, say, so I think there's two things in there. Um, one of them, alongside the comparability thing that I've mentioned earlier, is transparency. Uh, so I think actually just having much more of that data available about what goes on in the private sector. And I think my experience working in Scottish Enterprise is the thing that, that quite often changes the perception and the thinking in companies is for other companies' experience to be shown to them. Um, so it's much less about a uh, Scottish Enterprise or an account manager turning up and saying you should do these things because they're good for your business. Actually, I think what will be really helpful in that, so while the companies are very big and it is quite challenging in your area, Carol, I think what is helpful in there is that real businesses will be speaking about what their experience is as a business to other business people. But given, Carol, you touched upon the fact that 98% of private sector uh, enterprises operating in Scotland um, have less than 50 employees, um, and the legislation only relates to companies over 250 employees. So. As it currently stands, what real impact would it have on the um, gender pay gap? And if it was reduced to encompass more companies, what impact would trying to meet that gender pay gap have on the operation of a lot of small companies? I think the points that Linda makes are very valid. It's about being able to demonstrate to companies the actual benefits of, of reducing that pay gap. And more importantly, what kind of lies behind it. I mean, we found in our own organisation, um, you know, we, ha we have more women working part time, for example. Uh, more recently, we've got women at higher grades uh, working flexibly. But, for example, that mean, might mean working full-time compressed hours, which enables them to work full-time, but in a different work pattern. And, and we've seen that that has enabled women to, to progress up the grades, for example, maybe more quickly than they would have, have done in the past, or work at more senior levels. And I think it's examples like that which we can demonstrate to companies that there are different ways of approaching how to deal with it. Um, I think once you get into quite small com small companies, it is quite difficult, and that might skew statistics. I'm not a statistician, so I would need to to refer to colleagues that know um, more about that. But you know, when you get into small numbers of employees, having you know, it, it might skew data if if you if you go down to too low a level. Okay. Right. Thank you, um, Richard Leonard. 
Thanks, convener. <clears throat> my, uh, my question initially is to uh, Carol Buxton and to Linda Murray. Um, my understanding is that the number of account managed companies that uh, High and Scottish Enterprise combined have got is around about 2,800. Would that be would that be about right? Yeah. Um, could you tell us how many of those uh, companies that are account managed by you are run by women? So I think that we've got lots of different stats in there, uh, Richard, around uh, women. So I'm, I'm trying to just cast my mind back to what we do have. So we do a survey of oops, women who are accessing our services for the very first time. Um, and we've been doing that, I think, since 2011. And the most recent stats we have on that is that it's sitting around 48%. Um, it's women-led companies who are accessing our services for the first time. And I think in 2011, it was in the low 20s. So it's like somewhere between 21 and 25%. Um, we also uh, have done some work quite recently to look at um, where our primary contact is, which is not the same as being an owner or a leader. It, it just tends to be who is it that we are engaging with most often. Um, I can't think if that was the whole of the account management portfolio in Scottish Enterprise, but that was a 15% figure. Um, it was women who were 15% of the cases were our primary contact. Um, one of the challenges that we're having and around this is actually ownership and leadership in a company is sometimes split across male, uh, men and women. So it's quite difficult to work out. Is it primarily a women owned company or is there a mix in there where it's equally owned? Um, and the fact that when we're asking these questions, people are not obliged to tell us what their ownership structure is in terms of gender. Um, and, I, and for me, that would definitely be a space where I think the more that we can look at these things and the more transparent we can make it, the much uh, easier it will be for us to understand that in the, the coming years. I think in our area, the picture is probably, probably similar. We have about 35% of our account managed businesses have um, either are in a female ownership or a female in a partnership. Um, lower levels that have a, a female chief executive, um, which I think about 14% there. Um, and the figure of women in senior leadership positions is around about 45% in our account managed businesses. What we do see is a difference between um, our account managed businesses and um, our social enterprises where the figures are generally higher in terms of, of women in, in leadership positions. Um, we are seeing increasing numbers of, of women coming through some of our, our programs, for example, of, for example leadership, um, entrepreneurship, and innovation, those figures are rising a little. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I mean, just on the um, on the issue of um, account managed companies again as well. Um, one of the um, um, elements of the Scottish Business Pledge is to encourage uh, the companies that you deal with to um, attain uh, living wage accreditation. And um, when I looked um, last night, I think fewer than five hundred. Uh, accredited living wage employers uh, are in the private sector in Scotland. Uh, so even if they were all your account managed companies, that would still add up to uh, less than 16%, I think, less than 17%. So, you'd, so the, you'd be dealing presumably with, with a large number of companies uh, that are account managed by you that are not accredited living wage employers. And I know in the Highlands and Islands enterprise evidence, uh, you spoke about uh, the living wage been a key component in addressing the gender pay gap. So I wonder whether you've got any uh, comments on that. Certainly, it's very much part of, of our conversation with our account managed businesses, um, promoting the business pledge to them and the benefits of various aspects of the pledge. Um, I, would, I would agree the numbers that have actually signed up and are accredited today are relatively low. That doesn't mean to say that they're not necessarily committed to, to doing that. But our account managers, on that, that is a, a primary topic of, of their conversation with their businesses in terms of trying to demonstrate to them the benefits of um, signing up to aspects of the, pre the pledge, in particular the, the living wage. In the Scottish Enterprise area, I think uh, we've got about two thirds of the companies who are account managed would pay the living wage to their staff, but they're not all accredited. Um, so that there's definitely there's something in there about what companies do and whether or not they then go for accreditation. 
Um, and I think if you look at the, the numbers for the, the business pledge, the fact that the living wage is the mandatory element in that, we've got, uh, I think, somewhere like 33 34% of the business pledge sign-ups are from Scottish Enterprise Account Managed Companies. So it's a, a reasonable proportion, but uh, I guess still early days on that one. So just as a supplementary, why is there resistance to become an accredited living wage employer? know that I would necessarily say it's resistance, but then I haven't asked them if they're resistant to it or, or if it's just that they haven't done it. Um, so I, I, I don't know what the reason is behind that. I mean, lots of companies will, when you ask questions about things that are badges, eh, aren't particularly interested in badges. Um, lots of companies will look at things and think, oh, that feels quite political and I'm not interested in politics. And I've certainly had some of those conversations with companies that I've met. So there'll be lots of different reasons for them not having chosen to go down the route of accreditation while they actually still do that thing that we would like them to be accredited for. Uh, but, but, but you are charged, presumably, um, as the principal economic development agencies um, in Scotland, you are charged with uh, trying to break down those barriers and try to um, point out that it's not political, actually, it's both socially, economically, business-wise beneficial to you. And there are examples uh, that I certainly have cited in their written evidence of companies that have become accredited living wage employees and have, and have reaped the benefits of that. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. Yes, that is what we do in, in terms of trying to work with companies on a day-to-day -day basis and encourage them to do this. But we know it takes time. We know from other things where um, things are badged in the past that companies will do the things that you want them to do, but they won't necessarily sign up for the accreditation. And I, there's lots of examples I can think of in the past um, with that and, and various uh, other uh, badges that people have been asked to go for. Um, so it takes a long time, Richard, just to work with companies to convince them of the fact that the stuff that we all get at a kind of macroeconomic level um, really does make a difference for them in their day-to-day -day running of the business. Okay. Don't know, did Elman Murray, did you want to come in? Yeah, yeah th th thank you, Richard. Um, I, I guess I'm kind of mindful of what, what Linda's, Linda's said, but also... Um, we do have in, in um, the own, my own area that I work in um, examples of companies who would not sign sign up or become accredited simply because they don't want to put pressure on other smaller businesses within the area and they don't want to be seen as a business that does that. They want to be, um, I guess, quite consensual in the way that they work with other businesses um, in the local area. So, and, and, and that's, that's their decision to an extent. We, we, we can put some pressure on them, but it really is, is their decision. Um, the other point I wanted to make, though, was that um, the living wage is important. There is no doubt about that in terms of addressing the gender pay cap. But what's also really important is looking at um, how women um, engage in the workplace as well. So things like, um, is it part-time work? Is it full-time work? How do they manage their childcare responsibilities? Um, do they spread their childcare responsibilities within the household, for example? What support do we give to households more generally to do that? So those are all quite important factors. Um, we did a wee bit of re research uh, at the end of last year, which I can send into the committee if the committee is interested in this, which where we talked to um, businesses about what was int interesting to them, how, how they expected to employ in the future. We talked to parents of our schools to find out what would encourage more women to come into work as well. Um, and we did some um, basic gender analysis of the area as well, which might give you some more input, which is not so much from the account managed point of view, from Sc Scottish Enterprise or High, but more from a local authority point of view and how we are working with local businesses to create inclusive growth in the area. Um, thank you. I think there's a follow-up from Gillian Martin, and um, I don't know if Lynn Cadenhead wants to come in, perhaps following this on some of the issues we've discussed. I'm, I'm interested in your, your responses to Richard's questions around the account managed uh, companies and, and what the, the stats are and, and how many of them are actually run by, by women. Um, the prioritised sectors of Scottish Enterprise are also sectors that have large gender segregation by their very very nature. Um, and uh, as a result, I've actually got quite large gender pay gaps as well. I'm interested to know if you feel that you have got a duty not only to address that, but also to be maybe looking at... Um, more female-run businesses and the types of businesses there is and giving priority to them as well in order to re realise Scotland's economic potential. So I guess in that the space there, we do have um, 
I guess, fairly traditional sectors in, in some cases that are, would be the growth sectors, um, and the gender pay gap uh, is, is pretty obvious in those sectors. We did a piece of work, I think, back in 2015 with the Equality and Human Rights Commission, uh, looking at uh, gender issues within sectors, which was uh, really quite illuminating for us. And I guess what we do in that space about how we would work with sectors then um, is we use the information that we gathered from that exercise to go back out and say to sectors, do you understand that your sector as a whole, this is how it looks? Because uh, quite often companies are focused on what it means for them specifically as a company rather than thinking about the sector as a whole. Um, we would share that information with our colleagues and sector teams. And we've done quite a lot of work in, in Side Scottish Enterprise with our sector teams who are then engaging with companies in those sectors to make sure that this is on the agenda as a topic of conversation. So, so yes, we, we would be looking at that and thinking, actually, what would Scotland's economy look like if we had more women engaging in those growth sectors and if we had more women engaging in those growth sectors where they were paid uh, equally alongside the men who are engaged in those growth sectors? That work with your account-managed companies, are you doing that work on yourself. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to declare an interest here because I, I am the convener of the Women in Enterprise Cross Party Group. And uh, one of the criticisms that I've heard in the, the three or four meetings that we've had since I've been uh, in in convening that group is that women, I've got it written down here actually from, from a, a, a meeting that we had, I took a note. Some women feel that their businesses have been dismissed as purely lifestyle was the, the word that was used and therefore have not been taken seriously when they've been asked for business assist when, they, when they've asked for business assistance and this is a, a strain that's coming through from quite a lot of the women who run businesses that I speak to is that because they, maybe they run their business initially from home or it's internet based it's dismissed as lifestyle therefore they're not getting access to the same business support that, that, that others are. I've got to say, I was disappointed when I read that in the, the report as well, that people still have that, that perception. They, they perceive that they're being dealt with differently because their business has been allocated a, a label like lifestyle business. I think as a, a, an employer, what we're doing in that space is everybody in our organisation undertakes equalities training on a regular basis. So that's everybody from uh, the person who uh, does your admin all the way through mm. the chief. But it's day. not just an equalities issue. It's it, a realising Scotland's economic, economic potential. potential. No, absolutely. And I was about to say that what we do as part of that equalities training for our staff in Scottish Enterprise is we talk about the business case in that. So we're not looking at it solely from the point of view of it is an equalities issue but it's set within that equalities training piece that we do for our staff. But we are speaking to our staff about what does that then mean for the services that we offer? What might that mean for your engagement um, with companies? How might you be engaging with companies that are women-led? And, and like Carol, we see a lot more women-led businesses coming through in social enterprise as well. Um, so we are ex very mindful of that and take it very seriously and do make sure that all of our staff are given adequate training. I mean, is there anyone else who would like to come in on that? I mean, obviously, Lynn. You, uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll woman, come back to the statistics that were talked about previously. Um, my understanding is that the, uh, the maximum number of account-managed uh, companies by Scottish Enterprise that are led by females is about 11. But take the point that there is some, you know, there's some variety in terms of you know, how the definitions are made, but, but that's what we've been talking about. And we are working with Scottish Enterprise, uh, Highlands and Islands, uh, and Business Gateway to try and help them improve the number of account-managed businesses that are coming through, but it's still very low, around about 11%. And this comes back principally to what we were talking about earlier, that women do things differently. They have a different growth trajectory for their businesses. So you're never going to get the same amount of businesses coming through if, for example, you um, the, the, the system sets requirements for a business to be achieving a turnover of 5 million within three years' time women won't achieve that. They might achieve it a bit later, so automatically they're getting excluded from the process. Um, that may be perception, uh, it may be reality. We have lots of different uh, conversations from women on that. But the key thing is to keep coming back in general to the economic argument. If women started up businesses at the same rate as men, there'd be an additional 7.6 billion minimum contribution to the Scottish economy. Recent information suggests us that that is actually going to be a lot more. 
I also want to pick up on what Carol was talking about in that it is, in, is very, very important to consider part-time businesses here. It really is essential because women have different requirements in terms of their businesses. Part-time businesses with lower wages maybe suit some of them. So it's very important for them not to be dismissed. And um, it is not just a perception that women feel prejudged and dismissed in businesses. For very many women out there, this is an actual reality, as a lot of our research uh, recently has borne out. Um, just going back to the, um, the sectors question that you asked, and we've recently done some work on occupational segregation within the Highlands and Islands, and yes, there are specific sectors where that's very much more pronounced than others, and it does tend to be, you know, there's predominantly male-dominated sectors such as um, engineering, construction. I think um, we, we can't ignore the fact that some of the interventions here need to be taken at a much earlier stage rather than with, with necessarily within the workplace. We're doing quite a lot of work at the moment with partners around a science skills academy, which is about encouraging more, more young people into STEM education and considering s careers involving science, technology, engineering and maths. And I think there is an issue there where, where girls get you know, disassociated from that as, as they grow a little bit older. And I think that is a priority for us, is ensuring that these young people are becoming engaged at an earlier stage and how we can work with partners to ensure that. I think there are also issues, um, you know, particularly in more rural areas where things like the availability of childcare is, is extremely important. Even transport to workplaces can have a big impact on whether uh, people with caring responsibilities can work uh, full-time or, or part-time. So I think there's quite a lot of things that are, are indirectly associated. Also some you know, unintentional consequences of some um, actions that are taken anecdotally, and, and this is absolutely anecdotally, but uh, quite a number of schools, for example, um, are, are going to start closing early on a Friday afternoon. And as an organisation, we've had quite a few ref uh, requests recently about flexible working because there isn't enough childcare to, to deal with looking after your children on a Friday afternoon, so you have to make other arrangements, i.e. To, to look after them yourself or with your partner. So I think there are there are lots of aspects that, that add to this, um, and it's important that we try and look at things in the round. Um, Dean Lockhart and then Ash Denham had a couple of follow-ups on this. Thank you, convener. Yes, it was a question on gender pay gap in startups because I think it's a very interesting uh, discussion. It sounds like there are particular sectors where startups are predominantly female led, for example, social enterprise and perhaps other sectors. <laughs> other sectors, perhaps engineering, where they tend to be more male led. Is, is the gender pay gap in startups therefore led by different levels of profitability in those different sectors? Um, so that I would admire, I've been involved in a couple of startups where obviously it's the profitability of the company that drives the level of salary for the, the founder or even the key employees? I, I don't have statistics available to hand on startup specifically. I mean, the, the figures that we've got were really related to our account managed businesses, which tend to be slightly ahead on the, on the, the growth. I don't know if Lynn's got any stats? Um, I don't have any particular stats around, you know, startups, but it will most definitely be related to the sector. But we can certainly look in and come back back to you with something on that. No wider discussion. It does, doesn't necessarily need to be in relation to startups, but even with your account managed companies, do you have a sense of um, is, is profit a, a driver uh, to some extent of, of the gender pay gap? Um, I, I think the honest answer to that is I, I really don't know. Um, we, we haven't we haven't explored it in in that detail. I think um, certainly probably the difference between social enterprise and business does give a bit of an indication for that because I think probably my gut feel would be that maybe um, pay levels within the social enterprise sectors are potentially lower. I don't know. Own specific startups um, by sector and gender pay gap. Okay. Um, I, I guess 
Again, not, not any stats, but I guess based on um, information that we, we gather just from our local businesses in the area, um, there is something about, um, particularly for females creating their businesses, which is that it's predominantly to suit not just growing a business, but to suit, suit other aspects of their life. So the business is not looked at in isolation of its profitability. It's looked at from the point of view of um, how, it, how it fits with everything else that a, a woman requires to do at this point in her life. Uh, her life. So um, if there is a difference in how men and women look at that at that stage, then yes, yes, you, you will see that difference in profitability and, and, and what's driving them. Thank you. Just really coming back to it, again, it re-emphasises the point that we have a lack of information and a lack of relevant, useful statistics around here. Um, as a general observation, women are more interested in, in, in four things. So they're interested in profitability, they're interested in people, they're interested in planet, and they're interested in purpose. That is the drivers for the majority of women who are setting up and leading their businesses. And that will have an effect on you know, what they pay themselves, what they pay other people, because again, it comes back to this sustainab sustainability. Women businesses have a different growth trajectory and that will affect uh, pays. Um, it's just to come back to Gillian Martin's question about there being priority sectors in the economy, such as IT and energy, which obviously have very low levels of female participation in them. Um, it's been put forward that perhaps these industries could be encouraged to you know, um, have higher levels of female participation. Do you think there is a case there for um, making the support, maybe making the funding conditional for those sectors in order to try and, and get a higher level of, of women into those sectors? <laughs> I, I, I feel that conditionality, it's, it's quite a, a difficult topic. I think there are, are ways that we, we want to work with businesses to very much encourage them to do that. Um, you know, some of these sectors, um, the IT sector, for example, is we, we have quite a lot of FDI in that, in that sector. At the moment, given the, the economic climate, I think it would be quite a challenge to, to see things that could be potentially perceived as an additional barrier to investing in Scotland. Um, so I'm afraid I'm, I'm kind of sitting on the fence in terms of conditionality. I think uh, we would very much encourage, like to encourage people um, to do things differently. And I think it is about um, recruitment practices in terms of flexible working, how, how people can widen their, their um, recruitment pool to make it easier for women to join that workforce. Um, one, another thing in, in more rural regions is the rollout of digital connectivity is enabling people to work in a different manner, for example, particularly in some of the more IT-related sectors, if you can work from home, which can make a big difference. And we have had small examples of that within the Highlands and Islands, but nothing on a, on a huge scale as yet. I would echo what Carol has said there. I mean, there's been plenty of people from Scottish Enterprise at various committees in the past, so it'll come as no surprise that our approach is we prefer to encourage people, uh, the idea of a carrot as opposed to a stick. Uh, that doesn't mean to say we don't have those conversations inside Scottish Enterprise about where we might want to focus our efforts and what we might want to do. But in our engagement with companies and sectors, um, I, we would definitely be looking at taking an approach that's about encouraging people to, to look at what they do in a business and presenting the evidence from other businesses about why that's worked for them and what they might do in that space rather than a kind of straightforward conditionality close. Well, Murray, and then, yeah. then Caden. It's really, really just to pick up a point, partly in relation to um, the response to your question, but also something that was raised earlier on by Carol. Um, so there, there is a lot of work going on in education just now, because one of the other responsibilities for, an edu for a, a local authority is, is, is the education authority as well. So we do a huge amount of work um, with uh, the STEM subjects and encouraging um, particularly female participation. So examples of good practice for that. If you look at Ayrshire, we've got this Ayrshire Girl Can, which is the hashtag been, which has been developed with the, the college, which has been really, really 
um, I, I guess, highlighting um, the range of jobs that are available in the science, technology and engineering um, sectors and how attractive they can be to, to young women. And we do that from a fairly early age in school right through. We've also, through the um, developing Young Workforce initiative that's in place across Scotland. Um, we have been inviting many more businesses now into classrooms and into schools so that they get the opportunity to link up what a real job is um, alongside what qualifications and subjects that young people need to study to take them forward into that particular job area. So, so I feel that some of that work is, is already happening and we maybe need to, to work harder at that. Personally, I quite like the idea of, of making uh, funding conditional on gender, but um, and I think the, the the real reason for that is whilst it's very good to encourage people, you know, I, I do understand that. Um, Encouragement only goes so far, and sometimes you've got to be mandatory about things and, and set down, you know, the rules and responsibilities and uh, what people need to do. Um, the other element, though, is um, again coming back to reinforcing the economic argument to people as to why diversity is good for their businesses. So, for example, in uh, STEM areas, um, there's significant evidence to show that uh, women in companies really do power radical innovation. Radical in innovation leads to profitability. If you set down you know, the facts and the statistics and the hard facts and appeal to the people in that way, maybe you'll get them to come on board a bit, a bit more. Okay, thank you. Um, John Mason. Hey, thanks, convener. I mean, if you'll permit me, maybe I can do a follow-up first to just that last round of questions, because, I mean, if a business is coming in and it's perceived as a barrier that we should, you know, be encouraging them to take on more women, um, but we're also hearing evidence that, uh, you know, actually that business is losing out because there's a pool of talent out there that they're not tapping into. So how do we balance this up between the barrier or perceived barrier and missing an opportunity? I think from from my point of view, it, it's about supporting businesses to look at how they, they undertake recruitment. I mean, I think in terms of conditionality, I'm not sure what your thoughts were around what you would be saying, what you if you would be setting percentages of of um, gender uh, workforces, you know, would it have to be 50-50 or, or whatever, and how businesses would be expected to achieve that. I think what, what I'm saying is how we can, and I think a couple of others on the panel have said, how we can really demonstrate to businesses the benefits of having a diverse and um, a, a, a workforce that is well represented by both gender, uh, genders and how that um, promotes innovation, how you can encourage women into more leadership positions. I think um, I think there are, there are good examples of where gender diversity does support businesses, and, and Lynn has has spoken about that. I think in, what I'm trying to say about the conditionality aspect is is you know how how we would well one set the parameters and two then how we would police them. Um, we, what we want businesses to be able to recruit the best people and what we can do is try and tell them well by by extending your recruitment practices or maybe changing some of your employment practices you can open up to a much wider range of very well skilled people who can um, help your business to grow and succeed. I mean, would there ever be a case where a company was so intransigent that you would just refuse to continue supporting them? Well, I've, I'm not aware that we've ever come across that position, to be fair. OK. Um, the area I then wanted to move on to myself was more uh, to do with actual business startups. I mean, we've talked about the gender pay gap in new companies, but it's more the issue of, uh, you know, women do not appear to be setting up as many companies or businesses as, as men. And if I understood Ms Cadenhead, you said that the economy is losing out maybe £7 billion or, or thereabouts. So... I mean, why are women not setting up more businesses? Um, I mean, in the employment sector, we've had the evidence from some people that, you know, women uh, or men may be a bit more self-confident and go for promotion. So would that be the same in new businesses, that men are just more self-confident and start up more businesses? Do you want to I'll look at you. Oh, <laughs> Startups and, and new enterprises. <laughs> um, if women
women started up businesses at the same rate as men, it would be a 7.6 billion contribution to the economy. So it really is quite significant. Um, we've already covered a, co a couple of areas about sustainability. Women just do things a little bit, uh, a little bit slower. Um, a lot of people talk about women in business being uh, risk averse, actually. That's not the right phrase to you use. Women have um, advanced risk awareness. Um, and so what they do is they assess a lot of things more uh, um, in a lot more detail before they actually move ahead and, and start up. One of the key things, well, there's probably two key factors that hold women uh, back, back in starting up and growing their businesses. First of all is access to capital. Women start up their businesses on average with 30% less capital than a man does. However, the research indicates that if they started up their businesses with the same amount of capital, their businesses would, would do as well, if not better, and be more profitable and be more sustainable because they go from going for the longer term picture. So access to capital is really important. If you look at the community in Scotland, fundamentally the, um, you know, the access to capital, um, business angel capital and venture capital uh, um, and bank funding is predominantly driven by men. The, the investment decisions are made by men, they're assessed by men, it's predominantly driven by men. And with the best will in the world, men will tend to look at things the way that they think that businesses should grow, as in, you know, fast, quickly. So access to capital is a really, really important thing and what we need to be developing are more initiatives about patient capital, long-term patient capital, not looking for the quick wins, the quick bucks and the headlines. That is key. The other thing that is really important for, for women-led businesses to encourage them is around mentoring and the stage at when they start up their businesses. So most of our support in Scotland just now is directed to start up businesses, um, starting up the businesses, then growing and then scaling. However, what you actually need is pre-start support. And then before pre-start support, you need pre-pre-start support. This is the gradual building of the confidence um, in a, you know, a very um, wide-ranging way to give people uh, the information that they're looking for. At that point in time, women need to build up their networks and their social capital because they want to be able to talk to other people rather than taking a, a consultant in. Um, so, for example, uh, men value consultancy in terms of uh, starting up their businesses. Women place a lot more value on mentoring. A lot of the, the systems in Scotland are directed towards paying for paid consultancy for people who are starting up in business. But the vast majority of mentoring for people is expected to be done free. And so there's a real you know, disconnect there between what men and women want in business. So access to capital, uh, we need to look at patient capital. We need to look at the pre-pre-start uh, stage. We need to look at the pre-start stage before they get into other parts of the system. We need to greatly increase paid mentoring and unpaid mentoring for women and put more of an emphasis on that. And women um, need to feel as though they're less prejudged in terms of their businesses. Again, they don't like to be um, spoken to as kind of lifestyle businesses. And then the final thing, which I think is really important as to why women are not starting up businesses at the same rate as men, is the, is the use of language. Um, we need to be a lot more careful in the terms of gender appropriate language. So, for example, a lot of the language you see um, is about, you know, aggressive, fast, high paced, you know, real aggressive scale up. Um, are you an ambitious entrepreneur uh, looking for capital to grow your business rapidly? That will appeal to a certain type of female entrepreneur and, a cert and, and in general male entrepreneurs. If you had language saying, for example, are you looking for patient capital to grow your business sustainably over the next five to 10 years? That's where you'll get women coming forward and saying, we want to grow and we want to build our business. So there's a lot to be done about gender appropriate language and gender appropriate support for women to start up their businesses. So going back to your first point that you, you made um, that you know, women are thinking about it a bit more sensibly than men. I mean, it's part of the problem here that men are just starting up too many businesses and they're going in gung-ho without thinking about it. Hmm. Um, 
I suppose I'll answer it on, on, honestly and I'll say yes. Okay, that's, that's helpful, thanks. Can I, can I switch on to SC and HIE? Because, I mean, some of the answer we got there was that the, like the business angels and some of these venture funds and things are run by men and they're looking for quick returns and that's not fitting businesses that are led by women. So are Scottish Enterprise and HIE different in that respect that, that you're, when you look at investments, you're not run by men and you're more willing to wait for a longer return? Well, I think um, within Highlands and Islands Enterprise, we support a wide range of businesses. We have a segmented portfolio of high growth, um, down to, to development, which are maybe the, in the earlier stages. And I think it's looking at each individual business and seeing what they need and when they need it over the lifetime of that business. Not all the businesses in our portfolio are growing at the same rate or are indeed the same size. In some of our more per, uh, remote and peripheral areas, we're working with pretty small businesses, but that make a big impact in local communities. So the way that we, we work with them and the type of support we give them could be quite different to businesses that are in, well, have bigger businesses in a more centrally, um, highly populated area. There is a range of support available and it's really who needs what, when. And the actual support is being given, what, 50-50 by men and women, or does that not matter? Well, in terms of our in terms of our staff, yes. more than half of our account managers are female. Right, okay. We have more female account managers than male. So, um, in terms of some of our programs, if uh, women who are participating on the the program want a, a female ment mentor, they can ask for that and they will be given it. But it is a choice. You will find that some don't want, but some, if they do, they'll they'll get that. Thank you. I, I from that point of view of the decisions that we will make will be based on a, our understanding of the company a, specifically um, and to consider what would be the right thing for that company at the stage of growth that they're at that helps them unlock that next stage for them a, rather than it that, that being anything that's a kind of really kind of black and white decision that you would make it's very much based around the relationship that we have with companies when we're working with them about how we might support them um, I can think there's a couple of really good examples around uh, women-led businesses that have been supported through uh, SIB, the Scottish Investment Bank. Um, I can't think what the names of the companies are off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's one that uh, produces cycleware for women who's been supported by SIB. Um, so I guess what Scottish Investment Bank does in that space, uh, as you would expect from an economic development agency, is to act where the market fails to act. Um, so we would look at um, all businesses and whether or not they have the potential to grow and therefore have an effect on Scotland's economy. Um, and I think, uh, again, like that, I'm not sure what the breakdown is for our account managed staff, um, but actually quite a lot of what we do isn't around the account managed space. So I know we've talked a lot about account management this morning, but that, that's probably only just over 2,000 companies we work with in that space. But we would work with about 12,000 companies over the course of any given year. Uh, so the vast majority of the work that we do is not in and around the account management space. Um, and quite a lot of the specialist staff that we have, whether they are sustainability specialists, uh, ICT specialists or workplace innovation specialists, uh, that the gender mix there will, will be fairly equal. Okay. Sorry, okay. I just want to come back and make, a, make another point about um, um, managing sort of expectations about, you know, return on investment, you know, and time to exit. Because I, I've talked about patient capital and, and taking longer. Um, the whole system seems to be driven towards, um, you know, scale up aggressively really, really quickly. But in actual reality, there's a big mismatch, a mismatch in terms of expectations. Uh, the latest information that I have in terms of average return on investment for a technology company is about 3 to 3.5 return on investment. It's not the 10, 15, 20, 100 times return on investment that people are looking at. And again, on average, it's about 10 years before a company achieves exit, you know, in, in the high tech, you know, grow, growth sector. So can I just clarify, are, are you, when you say the system is kind of very aggressive, mm -hmm. it, are you including both the private sector and Scottish Enterprise and HIE, or are you distinguishing there? Um, I, uh, 
I will say the system in Scotland, and I will include both private and public sectors, because there is a there's a there's a there's a clear drive towards this aggressive, you know, high scale, fast growth, and it really does detract from the number of, you know, more uh, smaller businesses that want to grow moderately and and sustainably. So I will include the system there, as both. Okay. Um, so yeah, so um, return on investment about three to three point five, and exit is about, exit is about uh, ten years. So actually, it does take a long time to be able to get there. But the, the expectations of some investors um, and and you know and indeed the early stage companies are they going to get there in three three to five years, and that just doesn't happen. Thank you. Um, question from Gil Patterson. I didn't cover more or less what I wanted to say, I, but could I maybe go back to a question that Emma Murray raised? You were explaining to us that you're doing some work with regards to STEM subjects within school, but what you didn't say is, is it successful? Is it having an impact uh, 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 and with the, the, the children? Yeah, OK. I think it's probably just a bit early to say. We've, we've I mean, uh, some of the work that we're doing is with primary school age children. So, you know, you're looking at another five or six years before you see what businesses they end up going into, whether they create their own and uh, or whether they go into further or higher education to support that particular sector. Um, what I think... Um, we do need to do a bit more of, though, is um, developing more awareness with businesses of the opportunities that that presents as well and to get um, some of our businesses more involved in the education sector so that they can create that, um, I guess, that interest and that um, ambition and aspiration in those particular areas because those are, without a doubt, the, the um, higher paying um, job areas within our country at the moment. Um, there are some other um, issues that I was thoughtful about when, when others were speaking earlier on about um, a lot of the work that I guess local authorities do around economic development is probably at the earlier stage. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit more upstream and some of it will be with startups and some of it will undoubtedly be um, with uh, social enterprises, um, which do have a different business model, really. You know, thinking back to what Lynn was saying about, um, you know, whether it's aggressive uh, or not, then a social enterprise business model tends not to be so aggressive at all um, and, and does have a longer period to grow. Certainly that's what we see. Um, but when I'm talking about working at the earlier stage, um, what I've already said about schools, but also about how we grow some of our markets in Scotland. So the big areas of growth for us um, will be in the care sector, both in terms of children's care and older people's care. And those are areas, again, that local authorities are working with local businesses on, both to support that within their business and how they employ um, women particularly, um, but also um, how we grow those business sectors into being um, more sustainable businesses and, and also what opportunities that gives to women to create their own businesses in those fields because it is a growing sector. The, the committee has been discussing this at length and there seems to be key times where difficulties occur, and one of them is right at the start of life, I think, at, at school, or well, it's not what I think, I think that's what the evidence shows. And so we're looking at the possibility of the pipe not being filled up from the very start, so that the work that you're doing uh, to, to, to assist that, but there's another aspect to it, and I've already said, I've got a daughter of 16, uh, who's right now is studying for her hires, and that what I'm hearing is a parental influence in the decision of their onward journey. And I wondered, is that a responsibility for the, for the school to, in, in, in fact, perhaps educate the parents? Or is that something that is a difficult one to, to, to address? I think it's a difficult one to address. I'm not saying that we shouldn't actually be doing something about it. I think, think there are things that we can do about it. But I'll go back to my earlier comments today about how you do things by consensus as opposed to um, necessarily putting conditions around what you do. Um, we do a lot of work in early years around... Um, removing uh, traditional gender stereotypes from how young people and um, children think about what their opportunities and prospects are. Um, we continue with, that, with a lot of that through our schools. We won't do it all the time. Um, education in Scotland is, is, a, is a big part of our business. I couldn't guarantee that we would do this um, very well all of the time, but there are 
serious steps being taken now to change um, how we deal with those traditional stereotypes. Um, and a lot of that is happening through interest in some of the key subjects, but also bringing businesses more into schools as well, so that both women and uh, men get the opportunity to see what the opportunities are. Thanks for that. I don't. Yes, please. Oh, sorry, I was just going to follow up on something that Elma had said there about that how you connect businesses to schools much better. So I'm, I'm, it made me think about my own recent experience. I've just recently joined the West Region Developing the Young Workforce Board. Uh, so I've only attended one meeting, but as part of my kind of induction into that, um, I, I was really struck by what they've done in the area that can, covers West Region, um, where they've done a whole load of things actually for young women to go into very traditional male sectors. And I, I think it was Rolls Royce that they, they did uh, a couple of days um, activity around there that was very focused. Uh, large numbers of young women in school uh, being exposed to lots of different careers uh, that you could follow and career paths that you could take uh, in a kind of engineering discipline that. that uh, generally speaking, people would still perceive to be very traditional and male-dominated. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, I don't, the committee might be interested as part of your deliberations to look at um, what some of the developing the young workforce boards have been doing. I mean, they're, they're relatively new. They're only probably a couple of years, and some are still just being established. Um, but I was really struck by what the, the West Region Board had done around uh, young women into uh, uh, getting more traditional uh, male-dominated industries. Thanks for that. I don't know if any other panel members have a comment on uh, on that. I'm going to move on to another area. OK, thanks. The, the other thing is we know the government have got a 50-50 a target uh, set for a, a gender diversity to kick in in 2020. And I wonder if you thought that uh, two questions in relation to that. Do you think we'll meet our target? And do you think the legislation, mm -hmm. legislation is stringent enough to ensure that we do? I haven't looked at the legislation, so I don't know whether or not it's stringent enough. Uh, I think my position on that would be that I would hope that, uh, given that 2020 is not that far away, that we would meet the target. Um, and I know certainly we are working with partners like uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, uh, Changing the Chemistry, to try and uh, raise awareness in companies again about why diversity is an important thing for you to be thinking about uh, in your business and uh, a diverse board um, being really beneficial. I mean, there's lots of evidence internationally about about the, the return on investment in, in kind of straightforward cash terms that uh, businesses see by having a more diverse board. Um, and I, again, I can see there's, there's certainly some companies that I've seen internationally who uh, really embrace that idea that um, have sites and locations here in Scotland, and they are, are very open to sharing what their experience has been internationally and how we might apply that here in Scotland. I should have said public boards, actually, but I think the idea is public and yeah. encourage the private sector to come in yeah. on the basis of that. And, and I think, as Linda says, we, we have done, um, well, we've done work ourselves as public bodies to, to increase female representation on our boards. And like Linda, we would very much hope that the 50-50 by, by 2020 is, is achievable. We're, I think, about, about 45 um, at the moment. Um, in terms of the private sector, I think one of the things that we can do with partners, and we have done, is holding events like the one we held in February with the private sector, just to, to demonstrate to women what is involved in becoming a, bo a board member, both either public or, or private sector, and how they can contribute to that. And I think that's something that we would very much be interested in continuing to do. Okay. Yes. I think um, public boards, 50-50, by uh, 20, 2020 will probably be achieved. I think it will take significantly longer before anything like that is achieved in the private sector, uh, even from you know large companies down, down to smaller companies. I actually think it's going to take a generational change, a generational time period before we achieve 50-50 in the private sector. Thanks very much. Yeah. <clears throat> Perhaps uh, following in on that point, um, do the panel feel that um, the procurement process can be used to ensure fairness of treatment and pay? Yes. Um, and how? Uh, well, I think one of the things that we've done, um, all of our tender documentation very clearly says that we would encourage people to pay the living wage. And uh, if they're going to... Uh, bid for work with us and that we expect them to promote that in their supply chain. 
Uh, so again, it's in that space of encouraging. We don't measure it. It's not one of the criteria that we would score on when we're looking at tender documentation. But what we have seen since we've introduced that is that more people who bid for work from Scottish Enterprise are coming well prepared to have that conversation about, and this is what we are doing to address the living wage, uh, fair work practices. This is how this will play through in our supply chain. So uh, yes, I think uh, procurement is an area that we probably look and do a bit more in. To, to Linda, we, we do as well promote um, living wage diversity within our tender documentation and uh, the, the scoring can be quite difficult, though you, you do have to remain within the, the guidelines, but we, we do wherever we can promote that. And um, following on from that, will, will that, uh, just trying to look at things from a practical point of view, because um, a lot of people think of politicians or parliamentary committees or advisors and people at a high level as not being sort of connected into the real world, as it as it were. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, for example, in the care sector, it's predominantly um, female workers that work there. So if one is looking at applying to procurement rules about uh, employment equality, um, fair pay and so forth, um, there's different scenarios that play out on a, on a practical level or we've heard about construction work and the fact that huge numbers of construction workers tend to be male. So if you're talking about either public bodies or private bodies looking at employing from different sectors or engaging companies from different sectors, from a practical point of view, how, how is it will it be possible for them to engage with that? Or indeed, if they're looking at um, using companies who are SMEs, where you often have, in very small companies, you'll have huge gender imbalances one way or another, um, which may just be from the very nature of small companies, not necessarily an intentional thing or something that affects pay levels dependent on the company. How are, how are companies or public bodies to go, go about approaching that? I don't, I don't think there's a, a quick fix there because I think, as, as we've touched upon already, there is also an issue about having um, the pool of people that are sufficiently skilled and available for work to be recruited. Um, and we've talked particularly about, for example, construction. Um, in order for people to employ more females in the construction industry, there need to be more females with the, the necessary skills and qualifications to, to be employed. So I think it's going to have to be a, a two-way two-way approach, to be honest. We can, we can encourage businesses to look at their recruitment policies to try and ensure that they're not um, unintentionally excluding women from applying for posts by their working patterns or, or what they're expecting in terms of business travel, wh whatever that may be. But we also need to encourage to make sure that we have um, female participation in those areas and in those sectors to form part of that, that labour pool. And, and looking at uh, another aspect of that, um, I was at a meeting with men in childcare who received funding from the Scottish Government, and what we were told was that there's not a... Uh, the men involved... was that there's not a, a problem with men being employed in childcare, there's just a lack of men going forward or interested in that area of work. So it may not be just about... Um, barriers to men going into, for example, childcare or women going into construction work, but a lack of interest. And again, is that not something that has to be considered when applying standards or requirements to companies? Well, I, I think absolutely it would be something that has to be considered. And I think some of these issues are quite cultural as well. Um, and, you know, we've talk, touched a, a bit on oc occupational segregation, and I think a lot of that is cultural and traditional, and it's changing that will not happen, mm. happen overnight. And I think it, it takes a wide range of interventions from a wide range of partners to achieve that. So I'm afraid that's probably not really answering your question, <laughs> but I, th I think it is a very, very complex issue which has a, a wide range of, of aspects which need to be tackled. I wonder if I could just follow up on that with Lynn Cadenhead, um, again, trying to look at things from a practical point of view. 
um, you talked about the addition to the Scottish economy, I think, in terms of billions, if there were as many um, female-led enterprises as male-led enterprises. But I, I'm just wanting to test that because people will be saying, ah, but if I need one pair of shoes, I'm not going to buy two pair of shoes just because there's another six shops. So I'm just, I'm just wondering about these figures that are bandied about, about um, simply adding a huge amount to the economy by bringing in another set of enterprises, whether they're male or female-led. Do you break that down a bit for us? Yeah, I, um, I mean, this, this is backed up by a, num a number of research reports, including the latest one from Barclays Bank, in terms of, you know, the contribution to, to the economy would be very, very significant. Um, I'm not quite sure what you're driving at in terms of how to break mm. that down, but the one comment I do want to make on that is around childcare associated with that because one of the key barriers that stops the women going forward to start up their businesses is lack of childcare. If I give you um, an example of a recent um, business creation course that we did for the, the wives and partners of armed forces personnel, uh, nearly 30 women completely economically inactive totally economically inactive because of the very nature of their life and their work and their partners. We took them through a 10-week business course um, and at the end of the 10-week business course we had 15 women who'd started up in businesses, who had actually started up in business and started trading. And the fundamental reason, uh, well there's two reasons, but the fundamental reason that they were able to do that was they were able to come along to the course because we provided them with childcare. The vast majority of our grant that we received for that went on childcare to be able to help them, and then they, bond, they bonded as a, as, a, as a group. So now I'm not saying that these businesses are, you know, each and every one of them is going to grow to a massive business, um, but you know, some of these, many of these businesses are, are, are trading and they're trading well, and they might be contributing, you know, five thousand, you know, ten thousand, you know, twenty thousand. Some will grow, but they're contributing to um, their, their local family and their local community and that's very significant and they have also gained considerable amount of confidence and experience because they might not start up a business but at, at the, the number of women who went through that course decided that they didn't want to start up a business but now they actually felt ready to go out and try and get a job for themselves so there's lots of other things that need to be taken into yes, consideration. Sorry, my, my question is more about the market. If there isn't a market, you can't simply add $13 billion to the economy. You might alter the business structures and who runs the businesses and so forth, but it doesn't mean one automatically adds $10 billion to the economy if there's no market for services or goods. Well, we've shown with uh, the, the simple example that I've shown you already that, you know, these businesses are up and ro operating and are generating income and adding adding to their local community. Uh, you'd have to look at, you know, all the research and statistics um, throughout. But, you know, I stick stick by, by the facts from the Barclays report recently in terms of this will contribute to the economy. But again, we can go away and have a look at that in a bit more detail for you, if you like. Uh, and I suppose a follow-up question to that, is it the right thing to simply look at one measurement, that is um, money, um, going back to your point about the <coughs> desire to create sustainable businesses, which might not be immediately profitable, but long term um, might assist in having a stable economy. So is, is, are these monetary targets, goals or measurements the only thing that we should be looking at? No, it's really important to look at a number of different measurables and this has been a significant amount of work that has been done on the Ministerial Review Group um, of the Enterprise and Skills Agency. So we have been talking about, you know, rather than just looking at money and profitability, it's productivity, it's, you know, gender balance in business, um, there's a whole load of other statistics that need to be looked at and things that need to be measured in terms of inclusive growth for the economy and that work is underway at the moment. Um, and I want to follow up uh, with Emma Murray, um, a question about the city deal and um, how the performance in that is measured and whether or not um, your views on the best way that that should be approached. 
Okay, thank you, convener. I'm afraid I can't talk about the Glasgow City deal specifically, but generally, um, if I, I talk about growth deals, which Ayrshire has a, has a growth deal that's under development at the moment, one of the aspects that we are looking seriously at is how we measure inclusive growth. Um, so when you talk about measures, I think one of the measures that um, should be very, very important to us is the level of female participation across Scotland. So it's not just about the numbers of businesses that they set up and the um, I guess what the trajectory or the, 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 the profit making arrangements are of those businesses but the extent to which women are engaged productively and um, in a very healthy way across our workforce in Scotland overall so I, I do think that there are some measures around that that um, we should be given some further consideration to not least um, and, and this is one of the aspects of inclusive growth and the growth deal that we are working on is to tackle um, chronic uh, poverty in the area as well. So we have clear evidence that shows that where more women are in work, there will be less incidences of child poverty. And certainly for an area um, like North Ayrshire, where we have very high levels of child poverty, that is a key area that we want to address. And one of our clear measures to address that will be through getting more women into um, good, good employment. Uh, and has, um, can you, is there a relationship between child poverty and whether it's increasing or de decreasing in Scotland and uh, the subject we're looking at in terms of the gender pay gap? That's an interesting question. Um, what I can say is that in uh, our area there is a clear relationship between the poor levels of female participation and the high levels of child poverty. And we are quite clear that by addressing or increasing female participation in the workforce, that will have as an impact a reduction in child poverty. Um, whether or not that's the case across Scotland, I don't have that information. Thank you. And Linda Murray. I was just going to come in on at the specific point around measurement. Um, we this for our business plan for this year for the 17-18 year Scottish Enterprise is introducing a new measure uh, which will be published which is a measure of a fair number of companies introducing fair and progressive workplace practices um, I'm racking my brains at the moment to remember how we calculate that and I can't remember um, what the four criteria are apart from the one about the number of social enterprises um, but the business plan will be due to get published once we've gone through all the kind of pre-election periods um, but it, it's, it's I guess it's from that point of view about is it always about the money and the numbers? And the, the answer is no. We are looking at uh, how we might measure things differently uh, from an economic development point of view. So there will be a new measure in our business plan for uh, this current year uh, when that gets published. It, is that something that can be shared with the committee or does that have to wait Not until... Not at the moment, unfortunately, the moment, no. Right. no. Well. I, I will try and remember how we calculate uh, what the measure is other than social enterprise. I know there's four things and one of them is social enterprise. I just can't remember what the other three are. All right, thank you. Um, now come on to a question from Ash Denham. No, I think we've covered that, covered that one off already. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, convener. A couple of questions. First one is for uh, Carl Buxton from Hi. You, you say in your evidence that um, there are high levels of uh, occupational segregation in the Highlands and Islands, it's more pronounced, and that is a contributor to the gender pay gap, to the higher gender pay gap across the region. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that and why that is and what your response is to it? Well, <laughs> um, we, we carried out some research recently and I think occupational segregation does tend to be more pronounced in the Highlands and Islands than it is in other places. And although the sectors where it is most prevalent are probably similar to the rest of Scotland, so we're talking about um, more representation by men in some of, as we said, engineering, construction, and much higher representation of women in the caring professions, um, social services, that, that and, and the public sector. I think one of the one of the explanations is that we high, have a high level of public sector employment in the Highlands and Islands, so you know that does does. Um, have, a, have an impact where, where women are, are more um, represented there and they tend, there's, there's vertical and horizontal segregation, so not only across the sectors, but you know, within organisations, um, women employed you know, um, at, at lower grades sometimes, and that can be reflected in the, in the public sector too. Um, even at the Highlands and Islands level, it differs from area to area, for example, uh, Murray and Shetland 
have relatively high levels of, of segregation. Now, that could be because of the types of industries that are particularly prevalent there. You know, in Shetland, there's a lot of, of fishing, there's a lot of oil and gas related work. So, again, you, you can see reasons there. Um, what, what the research has told us in the main is that we really need to dig down deeper into some of the causes of that segregation and deal with them very specifically in small areas. There isn't a kind of blanket solution. And at quite small area level, there are things that could be done to try and change that picture over time. OK, and I noticed the research is done by an ECOSGEN. ECOSGEN, yeah. Yeah, you presumably are able to share that with it should, I think it should be available on our, our website, but okay. I can certainly get that for you to the committee. Sure, Grant, that's, that, that, that's super. Um, and my question for, for all the panellists then is, what um, kind of steps do you think the Scottish Government and indeed us as legislators should be considering in order to uh, reduce the gender pay gap, if indeed there is anything we can do in the immediate future? The Scottish Government's obviously got a fair business, uh, Scottish, the, the Scottish Business Pledge, the Fair Work Convention, etc. Are there any, is there any scope within those work programmes to do the kind of things that could begin to reduce the gender pay gap? I, I think there are very, sorry. There are various things we've, we've touched on. Um, I think, you know, Elma and, and Lynn both mentioned uh, childcare. Uh, again, we've, we've been doing a, a pilot up in, in Shetland and childcare can be a particular problem in more rural or rural areas, sparsely populated areas. And I think there are, there are things we can do about that, which are maybe not immediately obvious in how, how we um, affect the gender pay gap, but things like childcare, transport, availability of different types of employment opportunity, all can make a difference, particularly to um, enabling sectors of the population to engage in full-time employment rather than part-time, which can have an impact on the gender pay gap. I was just going to add on that one. I think there's a number of things that we've introduced in the last few years here in Scotland that uh, our, our guests are setting us off on the right path around this. Um, I think for me, some of it would be about how you take that much more holistic view. So. Um, we would be thinking about this from an economic development point of view, but absolutely, as Carol said, if childcare services don't exist uh, that can support people to move into the labour market, doesn't matter what any of us do from an economic development point of view. If, if, you, if nobody can look after your kids, you're not going to be able to go out and be economically active. And that's been a challenge, I think, in Scotland for uh, decades now. If I think back to when I first worked in economic development many years ago, uh, one of the, the, the key things that we did in the area that I worked in was to provide free childcare for people coming out of un unemployment to move into work, uh, because the biggest barrier that they had was that they, they did not have family support to look after their children. Um, so, yeah, I think a, a more holistic uh, approach around some of this, thinking about um, factors that you might not necessarily think about um, as part of a collective, because we tend to look at these things in silos and we're very issues driven. Um, if we take a, an approach that's much more about understanding, if we do something in childcare, what are the implications, not just around childcare, education, the best start in the early years for young people, but also what are the implications from the point of view of um, people's ability to be economically active and to contribute? Um, Elma Murray. Yeah, thank, thank you, convener. Um, I, I guess um, what, what we're all saying in one way or another is that it's not just about one or two things. There's a whole range of different things that we should be doing um, all um, at the same time to try and create the right environment for this to change and to change in a sustainable way. Um, so we've heard, uh, I'm not going to repeat some of the things that the other panel members have, have mentioned around childcare, but I will say that there's, there, I think there are some issues we can do around recruitment, um, and particularly around the language that we use when we, when we take forward recruitment, so that we are much more encouraging and much more diverse away, aware in our uh, recruitment uh, approaches. I think there's a lot more we can do with businesses around um, promoting things like interest in STEM, but also... Um, and local authorities are probably not too bad at this, where they, um, their employment practices allow for um, caring uh, responsibilities by um, employees to be shared, whether it's um, men or women, 
um, that, that undertake those caring responsibilities. So to give you an example, um, we have parental leave in local authorities. So it's either parent that can take the leave to look after a child, or there might be caring leave for an, uh, an older person in the family to, to help support them as well. Um, but promoting that with businesses as well would be uh, another good, good step. And one of the, the things that we've done recently um, as part of um, our employability programmes is that we've had a, a programme which has focused specifically on lone parents um, to encourage lone parents to come into work. There was hardly a person in the room that didn't have at least three children um, and uh, many of them had four or five children. They received all received a qualification from college as part of the programme. So by the time I met them all when they were coming in to work in the council to start their six month employment um, experience, um, by that time they all had a qualification that they'd got from the local college. Um, they were about to start six months experience, so they were going to finish that in a position that none of them had ever been in before, where they had a qualification and legitimate and valid work experience as well. And they were so excited about doing this. So it feels to me that there's probably quite a lot of those kind of things that we can do. And if I'm one authority doing that with 24 people, I think that's something that could be done at scale. I think finally and briefly, if we might, from Lynn Cadenhead. Uh, I, I won't reiterate um, other comments about childcare uh, statistics uh, very quickly. I think uh, the importance of relevant and real role models at all stages of the journey for people uh, and these, you know, appearing regularly in the, in the appropriate media is, is essential. But um, more importantly, kind of pulling the threads together of what everybody else has spoken about. If we want to look for quick wins and make sustained, you know, generational, you know, uh, change, one of the key ways that we could think about doing that is by considering women as a sector. Um, you know, this is women as a sector as a key, you know, strategic objective for the government, and that brings everything together in terms of the backbone backbone because there's lots of great work going on there by so many different people but all seem to be sort of in different pockets and it needs to be linked together in this holistic approach so women as a sector would be uh, could be transformational all right thank you to our panel members i'll suspend the session now and we'll uh, have a brief uh, interlude of about 10 minutes till we move to our next session with the minister thank you
Um, welcome back to this session of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Uh, may I welcome uh, Jamie Hepburn, Minister for Employability and Training, and also Lorraine Lee, who is a Senior Policy Executive uh, of the Fair Work Directorate of the Scottish Government, and uh, Emma Congreve, who is e an Economic Advisor uh, in the Housing and Social Justice Directorate of the Scottish Government. Welcome to all three of you. Now, I understand, Mr Hepburn, a very brief opening statement of a couple of minutes or so. I'll probably, I'll endeavour to take less than a couple of minutes, the convener. Uh, suffice to say, I'm uh, very glad that the committee is looking at this uh, particular issue as a priority area for us as an administration uh, as well. I'm glad to be able to be with you uh, today, although I did notice you tweeted earlier today that I'm being a bit of a guinea pig. You're live tweeting this session. It's the first time you've done it before, and we've to all to let you know what you think afterwards, so I'll be sure to let you know what I think about uh, the efficacy of such an approach as well, but uh, very happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Well, we'll look, look forward to your written submission after the session on live tweeting. Um, could we start, first of all, with a question from Bill Bowman? Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, as you may know, we have a, a sort of standard question that we've asked all the panels uh, at, at the beginning of each session about the statistics available and um, whether they're happy with what they have or whether they may like something else. So uh, if you don't mind, I'll ask you the same question and we'll get your, your thoughts on that. And the question is, is the minister confident that we have a defined set of agreed statistics on female economic activity in Scotland and on the pay gap? In terms of uh, how we define it in relation to the national performance framework, clearly we've set out the, the measure we utilise in terms of there being a, some form of uh, internationally agreed standard. I'm not aware of there being such. I think different jurisdictions use, use different uh, measurements. Clearly for the national performance framework, we uh, use a, a median uh, measure. Uh, that's drawn down from the Office of National Statistics. It's the measure that's used uh, elsewhere in the UK, so it offers comparability in uh, that uh, sense. Uh, the OECD also uses a, a median measurement, albeit a slightly different one, than we utilise for the national performance framework and the ONS uh, applies. Uh, there are advantages to that uh, as a measure uh, in terms of, uh, I think, it, uh, giving uh, a better indication of what typical uh, pay might be, but equally I recognise there are some limitations too in terms of uh, not uh, assessing uh, part-time pay. We know there are a, a disproportionately large number of uh, women in uh, part-time employment, so some would argue that we should be utilising that as part of the measure measurement. I'm also aware some would suggest we use the, the mean uh, measurement uh, as well. So uh, there are different perspectives on this. I know that that's been part of the, uh, the evidence that you've uh, been gathering. Uh, I would reflect there is no uh, one standard uh, definition, and as part of your uh, inquiry, if there are recommendations made, we'll of course reflect on that. I can tell the uh, committee uh, convener we, of course, uh, we continually look at what's in our national performance uh, framework, and uh, going forward, we're uh, looking to give consideration of the addition of additional information about a range of other uh, measurements, so that uh, there's transparency uh, in relation to that. We don't intend at this stage to, to change the, the single nef definition we use. I suppose it was also, I would also further observe the purpose of the National Performance Framework is to indicate progress against the specific measurement we utilise, the way, the way we measure that against any of the indicators we include is whether performance is improving, performance is stable or performance is worsening. That would be the case no matter what particular measure we, we utilised. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you mentioned the use of the mean and, and part-time certainly were issues that have come up. The other issue, or one of the other issues, I think, was more information on sectoral um, um, statistics so that uh, we can see across the various parts of the economy why or you know, what the, the figures might be there. D did you say you were not thinking of looking to um, take account of some of these comments at the moment? or? Yeah. No, no, not yet. I've no, not mentioned not anything about the, the issue of uh, intersectionality or specific uh, sectors. What I, I can say is that information, uh, or some of that information, is uh, available, and we do publish that on uh, our website if the committee hasn't 
of attention or the particular areas of the website that we publish that on hasn't been brought to the attention of the committee, of course we can uh, provide that if the committee uh, uh, would like. What I will uh, agree and, and reflect on is that there is, and this isn't specific to the gender pay gap, it's uh, an issue across uh, a range of uh, markers about the labour market. I think I reflect on that in my appearance uh, before the committee when I came to speak about the labour market strategy uh, some time ago, uh, now convener that there are a variety of gaps in terms of the information we gather. Now, one of the things we're doing through our labour market strategy is we are considering what particular areas we can, we should focus on. That's the, the first uh, element. And then we look at how we could uh, draw down such uh, information. So this will be uh, an important area for us. And if the committee has recommendations to make around the gender pay gap for the, uh, the labour market strategic group, then that group will, of course, reflect on it. Thank you. And now a question from Gordon MacDonald. Thanks, Convener. Um, I wanted to ask you about the pay gap reporting legislation. What impact do you think it will have on the gender pay gap, given that it only relates to companies or organisations with more than 250 employees, and that of Scotland's 350,000 pri private enterprises, 348,000 of them have less than 50 employees? It well, indeed, I think that's an important observation uh, to make, uh, Mr MacDonald. Uh, in fairness, whilst the number of uh, companies is uh, small, I think we would reflect on that of the proportion of companies who will now have to publish such information, it does account for something like 45 per cent of the workforce, although I would reflect that is still uh, a minority. Uh, that's not a policy we've set, that's the UK government's uh, policy. Um, uh, we uh, can, of course, raise uh, these matters with uh, the UK government, indeed, I suppose this committee, if it's so minded to, can raise it directly with the UK government. What we can do, of course, is uh, lead uh, by our own uh, example in terms of uh, those uh, public sector agencies that we have responsibility uh, for. We've reduced uh, the threshold to uh, those organisations with 20 employees or more that have to report such uh, information. So, um, whilst, uh, and of course, we will, through our entire process of engagement in the Fair Work Agenda, I would be willing to discuss these matters with uh, uh, companies uh, that are in the private sector and the, uh, the, uh, the third sector where we don't have policy responsibility for, so we can't set uh, that target. There obviously has been a statutory target set by the UK government. We can work with them to see if they are prepared to, to go further and uh, provide uh, uh, more information where they don't fall into that uh, category. Uh, but I suppose what we can do is lead by example. We've done that in terms of uh, our reporting threshold. Uh, you mentioned that um, there isn't necessarily enough data. I mean, what, what can the Scottish Government do in, in working with the UK Government to provide more data in this area um, in relation to the pay gap, given that most companies only have to report at UK level? Um, that's uh, undoubtedly correct, and um, that's also correct the information we utilise. What we then have to draw down is drill into what the Scottish specific figures are. Now, sometimes that's more difficult depending on the particular uh, data source, because that could be a very small uh, sample and become uh, rather less meaningful uh, in terms of providing any uh, useful uh, uh, data. So that's, for example, that could be the starting position. Maybe that's something we discuss with the UK government. If there's methods by which we can gather data ourselves, then we can reflect on that. I suppose it goes back to the uh, the fundamental point I made around the, the labour market strategic uh, group. These are issues that we're considering uh, right now. The starting premise uh, is what information should we gather without uh, uh, there being any uh, incumbent to, to considering what we should be looking at. We then, now, then need to drill into the practicalities about how we would go about that, whether it would be possible uh, to, to gather such data, and if there's uh, further work we need to engage in. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. And now a question from Ash Denham. Um, the subject of uh, procurement levers and using them possibly to influence um, greater gender equality has come up a number of times in, in some of the panels that we've had so far, and particularly Peter Rieke gave evidence to the committee um, last month, and he suggested there might be a number of ways that this could be accomplished. So he said that we might be able perhaps to exclude certain parties from tendering for specific reasons, or that under the Fair Work Practices regulations, we could possibly add in a question 
about the gender pay gap and then score those responses and then use that scoring during the tendering process. Is this something that the government is looking at? Is it something that we could look at? And do you think it would be feasible? Well, certainly the things, you know, we can look at anything that's uh, suggested of us. Uh, in terms of uh, the whole uh, agenda of uh, procurement, I'm aware that was something that we discussed uh, on a general basis when I was at the uh, committee uh, before. Uh, and I think uh, we've done uh, quite a lot of work uh, in terms of the uh, procurement uh, Scotland regulations that we've laid in 2015 to uh, ensure that a range of fair work practice can be uh, a, a criteria upon which any pre body procuring uh, a service or a contract can uh, utilise as part of their uh, assessment process. Uh, the gender pay gap isn't specifically cited, but there are uh, areas around um, uh, promoting equality of opportunity, developing a workforce which reflects the population of Scotland in terms of a range of characteristics, including uh, gender. So, uh, uh, in of itself, that could be a part of the, the work uh, they undertake. Uh, but if there's uh, something else we can look at and we think it's something we can take forward, then we'll certainly reflect on it. It just seems that, that it might be a good way to get that in there. It could be put in. Employers obviously would have to reflect on that. And then um, during the procurement process, it could be taken into account. Do you think it would present any particular problems for SMEs tendering? Because obviously smaller companies you know, might have particular challenges around maybe um, having women at senior levels and, and that sort of thing. It Yes, although I don't think I think the evidence that's been presented to you, and certainly evidence I have, would suggest that it's not just uh, an issue for small and medium enterprises in terms of having women women at a senior uh, leadership role. Uh, in terms of whether it would uh, produce any significant burden on a smaller and medium enterprise by comparison to any of the uh, things that would be required of them as they tender for a, a public contract, I honestly can't say definitively, instinctively. Uh, I, I'm I can't see the reason why it would, but clearly where we would uh, seek to add anything uh, or alter uh, the, uh, the regulations, if that was something we were minded to do, then we'd need to consult on that and, uh, and see what uh, any consequences of changing them might be. OK, thank you. Uh, John Mason. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, earlier on this morning, we had Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise in uh, as part of the panel. and. I mean, we did ask them about how much they were pushing, uh, you know, on this kind of issue of the gender pay gap when they are looking at supporting and giving grants and the, the various things that they do. I think I got the impression they were a bit wary of pushing it too hard because they want businesses to come in here, foreign businesses to come to Scotland, and they didn't want to kind of put up another barrier. Uh, and they felt that maybe by pushing the gender pay gap too hard, that might put up a barrier. I just wonder if you have any uh, thoughts on that. Well, I, I suppose I would reflect on uh, two things here. The first issue would be uh, the work that is being undertaken uh, by both enterprise agencies uh, internally in terms of uh, their own uh, practice. And I'm aware uh, that there's been a range of uh, work uh, internally, both in, within Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Enterprise, Islands, uh, Enterprise to uh, look at their own pay and grading policy, which has led to uh, internal uh, improvements. There's also uh, some work uh, underway uh, in terms of uh, how uh, the uh, agencies interact with uh, employers to uh, support uh, the attraction of uh, new uh, businesses uh, here. Uh, both organisations are, of course, members of Close the Gap, which is an, uh, a, a, a partnership that we fund. Uh, they've assisted with the design of uh, Think Business, Think uh, Quality Diagnostic Online uh, Toolkit. So there is uh, work underway. Now, I've not, uh, I was half watching uh, some of your evidence session before, Mr uh, Mason, but I uh, haven't seen uh, its entirety. But my expectation would be that both uh, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, all those involved in this uh, area would take uh, such a responsibility seriously. Yeah, I mean, I'm not suggesting they weren't taking it seriously, but I think it's, it's the kind of approach that they, they want to be supportive, they want to be encouraging. That's the kind of wording they were using rather than, you know, taking maybe a firmer line. And I, I think it's that area that we're in as to how firm a line should they take. Um, I mean, if, if, if a business is really not uh, doing an awful lot to promote uh, gender equality and, and cutting the pay gap, 
you know, should the, the level of support to that business be reduced? Well, I think the level of support to that business to get them to do rather better in terms of closing the gender pay gap should be increased. It clearly, we want to, we do want to attract investment here. Um, if there is a particular issue around a particular enterprise that needs to do rather better in terms of closing the gender pay gap, I don't know that that should prohibit them from getting support, financial support from the, the particular uh, enterprise agency that would be relevant. Um, but uh, my expectation, my clear expectation would be that uh, Scottish Enterprise, uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise would, and indeed the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency going forward, which uh, we have uh, obviously committed to establishing as part of the uh, Skills and Enterprise uh, Review, it would take that responsibility very seriously. They have a critical role to play in terms of working with employers to close the gender pay gap. Now, one of the uh, limitations, of course, we have is that we don't have responsibility uh, for uh, employment law. So, again, this goes back to a lot of the work that we engage in in terms of um, the, uh, the business pledge, uh, the fair work uh, framework. It's about uh, working with uh, employers to try and explain to them why it's in their own enlightened self-interest to, to be involved in this area. And I think there's a range of evidence that would suggest in terms of uh, productivity levels in terms of, indeed, I think, I don't know if the uh, specific evidence has been presented to the committee, but there's also evidence out there that would suggest even things like your share price would uh, uh, do rather better by tackling the, uh, the gender pay gap and also ensuring that you have uh, 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 women on your uh, board. Um, then we need to go out and speak to, to companies and employers and say, well, it's actually in your own interest to be doing rather better in this regard. OK, thank you. <coughs> Um, thank you. Uh, Minister, a number of uh, Scottish enterprise priority sectors, including IT and energy, have very low levels of female participation. On the other hand, there are sectors in the economy, such as the legal profession, where there's very uh, an increasing feminisation, is what one of the, our witnesses, what she said about that, where the preponderance is for females rather than males to go into the legal profession, thereby creating the opposite imbalance, as it were, from what was there 30 years ago. Now, we've also heard evidence um, from a number of sectors. So in the apprenticeships, I think the difficulty is that it's predominantly male uptake. Um, university, it's majority female uptake. Colleges is roughly 50-50. So my question is really, what thoughts do you have on addressing what is sometimes referred, I'm not sure if the phrase is an accurate one, but as occupational segregation or what I might refer to as imbalances, which uh, seem to come in. And th this is a, a question, an issue that is not going away from the evidence that we've heard. Um, what measures do you think could be taken to encourage more of a balance in across the board in a variety of professions? Well, certainly occupational segregation is the term terminology that we uh, would uh, use. Um, I don't think that tells the whole story, though, because uh, even uh, it is a critical part, I should start off by saying. We do need to do more, and we do need to do rather better in ensuring uh, more female participation in what is viewed as traditionally the preserve of uh, men in uh, the labour market. Equally, the flip side of that, I should say, is we need to do rather better in ensuring a greater participation of men in what is traditionally viewed as the preserve of women in the labour market, the, the social care sector being, I think, the prime uh, example. Uh, so that is uh, undoubtedly a critical element of uh, the, uh, the equation. Uh, there is a range of work uh, underway uh, in terms of the, uh, my colleague, Shirley Ann Somerville, has published the draft STEM strategy. A significant element of that strategy, of course, is to do rather better in terms of encouraging uh, women or girls in the school environment to, uh, first of all, uh, take up uh, STEM subjects in uh, greater uh, uh, numbers. Um, uh, in terms of our modern apprenticeship uh, frameworks, we need to, there's the Equalities Action Plan, which uh, SDS has uh, published and is working towards to ensure that where there is a 75 to 25 percent gender imbalance in any specific framework, that they need to be uh, working to level that out. Uh, that work uh, is underway. Incidentally, where you refer to um, modern apprenticeships being uh, the uh, 
predominantly male. That is the case. I, I readily concede that, convener, but there has been uh, a journey in that regard. In uh, 2008, it was around a quarter of all modern apprentices were, were female. Uh, in the year, the last year for which we have full information available, I think the figure was at 41 per cent. So there has been a progress, although underlying that, I would readily concede there needs to be more done within a uh, specific uh, framework. So, it, certainly, there's more we need to do to encourage greater participation. But that can't tell the whole uh, of the entirety of the picture. If you take STEM as an example, uh, for, for instance, um, even where women uh, undertake uh, STEM studies at university uh, level, uh, once they graduate, only around 27% of those uh, women who have a relevant qualification actually go into work in the STEM sector. So we also need to look at the, the institutional uh, barriers, the societal barriers and the cultural barriers, uh, which I think uh, I'm undoubtedly indeed, uh, having just referred to the fact I was uh, listening into your session before you were touching on that in terms of uh, the burden of uh, caring responsibility uh, falling predominantly on women with the consequential uh, career breaks uh, and so on that have uh, that uh, wider impact in terms of participation even where uh, women go on to achieve the relevant qualification. I don't have the information before me, but undoubtedly that's probably true in the, the legal profession as well. More women might be coming in, but at what level are they ending up throughout the entirety of their career? Yes, I mean, I, th I appreciate the points you're making about specific sectors and areas and specific measures. I'm just wondering if there's um, a sort of overall approach that we're missing out and have been missing out uh, to try and deal with the fact that we seem to take specific measures in an area which then creates a different imbalance 10, 20 years later, whether or not there's a, a more um, overall picture or approach or forward-looking uh, approach. And that's not to take away from specific measures for specific sectors, areas, issues. Well, we're alluding to, uh, convener, having reviewed some of the evidence before you, I think there's been a suggestion from a number of uh, witnesses about there being one overarching strategy for the gender pay gap. Now, I'm not going to sit here and commit to, to doing that. I think I want to reflect on the evidence uh, you've taken. What I can, of course, uh, say is that there are, there is a, has been and continues to be a range of uh, activities across a a multitude of uh, areas that would impact in this uh, particular area. For example, we fund and are a partner of family, uh, uh, flex family, I always get this wrong, flexible, friendly, working Scotland. I always want to throw family into the equation there for some uh, reason, because it is about uh, the impact on families. We fund that uh, partnership. Uh, we also uh, provide funding for uh, Women Enterprise uh, Scotland, working in uh, coalition with the Scottish Chambers of Commerce to encourage a greater number of uh, female entrepreneurs. We also have provided funding for, and indeed I just announced last week, uh, further funding to uh, uh, encourage uh, more women to uh, return to the workplace after a career break at a, a level uh, that is uh, proportionate commensurate with where they left uh, before they, they took that career break. So there is a range of activity underway. Whether we need to coalesce that into one overarching strategy, I have an open mind at this stage. And if uh, the committee is taking evidence that provides a compelling case, then it's incumbent on me to reflect on that. Thank you. And a question from Gil Patterson. Let's give you that. Uh, if female businesses start ups uh, match males, there would be another 100,000 businesses in Scotland. Is there enough funding uh, and support for women owned businesses through the Enterprise Network? Um, well, it's hard for me to say whether there's enough funding. Um, there is obviously a range of. Uh, I think we provide significant funding to support business startup. But it is undoubtedly uh, the case that if you look at entrepreneurial activity and business startups, men are about twice as likely to have started up a business as uh, women. So we need to get underneath that and find out what it uh, drives that. Um, that's why, for example, we fund uh, Women Enterprise Scotland, working with a range of partners to uh, undertake a range of measures such as peer mentoring, uh, providing link up with um, angel investors uh, to uh, to attract the relevant uh, finance um, 
to to that uh, to that end. In terms of the overall funding that we provide to support our enterprise agencies to to support business startup and also through local government, I think we we provide a lot. I think it's about trying to attract more women to be part of that equation, Mr. Patterson. And I suppose the follow-up question to that: if we had the evidence that uh, by giving that additional financial support, would the government have it in its powers, and would it be would it consider that to intervene in mm -hmm. that way? Well, of course, we'll consider anything that we think is effective uh, and relevant to any particular area that is a priority for us. So um, I wouldn't close down consideration of any a particular recommendation. Uh, in terms of uh, how we achieve that, then, of course, we uh, we need to look at uh, any budget that we set uh, in any particular year and uh, find the resource to, uh, to, to match that that ambition. So, again, it comes down to what evidence is provided and what the recommendation might be. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, and Julian Martin. <clears throat> to kind of supplementary to, to Gil Patterson's question, in the last session, and I appreciate you might not have seen all of it, uh, Mr Hepburn, but there was uh, a really interesting line of, of discussion off the back of some of the questions that John Mason asked uh, Scottish Enterprise about how what they look for when they're allocating funding and assistance. And there was, there, there has been a sort of quite a lot of anecdotal evidence coming through that they're looking for uh, growth and a certain amount of, uh, you know, um, expectation that a, a company is going to grow rapidly, and that is excluding a lot of female businesses from accessing that kind of support because uh, women businesses tend to. Um, be more risk averse, but also perhaps portray themselves in a different way and place more importance on sustainability. And that, I think, is an issue that really needs to be looked at. I mean, has is, is that been your experience that, that perhaps the enterprise agencies maybe need to look at with a gender lens on how they are actually approaching how they uh, deliver support and, and, and how they allocate finance? Well, I certainly know that that's been an element of the work that uh, Women in Enterprise Scotland have uh, taken forward in terms of the point I just made with uh, in response to uh, Mr Patterson's uh, question around trying to ensure better link up with angel investors that is very much on the basis of the proposition that you've just put to me Ms Martin around uh, longer term uh, return I suppose there's two things I could reflect on um, one uh, there, there should be no reason that women led businesses can't uh, see significant growth uh, in a short period of time uh, either, just as much as a business led by a man. So we need to get underneath why that might uh, be felt to be the case, if it is in fact uh, the case. A lot of this evidence, as you have uh, set out, is anecdotal. I think we need to, to look at that uh, further. Uh, in terms of um, financial return, uh, my view is that, uh, yes, we should also take a longer term uh, view, and if uh, a business might take a, a little longer to get there in terms of its growth, there should be there should be no reason for that to be uh, to be cut off at the knees immediately. Uh, in terms of what support uh, should be provided, I think we need to look at whether it's a a key growth area for uh, the economy, uh, and in terms of the uh, the high skilled uh, jobs that we hope to have here in Scotland, uh, in terms of uh, the future and its sustainability as a, as an employer, uh, if that uh, might require. Uh, slightly slower, uh, but more sustainable growth, then that doesn't mean it should be off the table. Interesting. Um, it was Women Enterprise actually mentioned it, that there's, I wonder if there's been a, an analysis done on the people who are getting support, perhaps where they have maybe overestimated their growth potential at the, the, the point where they're actually trying to access support, and if there's not been an analysis done on whether they're actually realising that potential or not, um, is that something that you would be interested in, in looking at? It is certainly something that we can reflect on. Uh, I would imagine our enterprise agencies will already have that uh, information and can uh, provide uh, such uh, through the, uh, the various employers they have supported, the various employers that they uh, account manage. Um, if we needed to, to do some more work in that regard, then again, I'm, I'm happy to, to consider any particular recommendation about it. And while we're talking on the subject of analysis, um, another thing that's coming out when we're speaking to the enterprise agencies is um, that they really 
rather than saying to companies that they should be doing, uh, should be closing the gap under any kind of like equality issues or societal social justice issues, um, they should be making the business case. So therefore, there's not more analysis required on what the business case actually is and for for closing the, 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 the gender pay gap and how we might go for it. Maybe it comes back to Bill Woolman's question around uh, having better data. I think there is information already, certainly uh, a range of academic uh, research uh, that uh, shows the, the business benefits uh, inherent within our labour market strategy. We also uh, recognise the, uh, the, uh, the economic uh, benefits as well as the social benefits, but the economic benefits of a, a more inclusive uh, labour market. So I think there is information available. Uh, if uh, more is required, then, then of course we'll, we'll look at that. But uh, my uh, view is that it probably it's uh, fairly well understood, uh, certainly in academic circles, and they've got the information that we can we can look at. And uh, uh, my view is that's why we should be working towards a more uh, collaborative and inclusive uh, labour market, a more collaborative and inclusive economy. Uh, thank you. And Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, Minister. In previous sessions, we've heard from witnesses about the importance of encouraging women to return to work after a career break for whatever reason, and the valuable role played by, by older women in the workplace. Uh, two questions in this area. You mentioned that you made an announcement uh, on this uh, topic last week. Can you talk us through uh, what specific measurements the government has in place to, to encourage women uh, to return to work and, and, I guess, in particular, return to the role or, or a, an equivalent role they had before uh, the career break. And secondly, I understand the funding available uh, from the Scottish Government in this area is £250,000. Perhaps that's changed in the last uh, week or so. Is that enough support, do you think, to encourage uh, female workers back to, back to work after a career break? So I, I suppose the point to make here, Mr Larkar, is that this is very much about uh, uh, testing out what might work. So. Uh, this falls on a, a, a more limited amount of money that we provided to Equate Scotland to support women to return to the uh, STEM sector. Um, I readily concede it was a, it was a fairly limited uh, project, a fairly limited uh, number. We are now, uh, my perspective was that the STEM sector is very important for the Scottish economy and it's very important uh, to, for, to me and I think to the economy to try and ensure that more uh, women participate in that sector and allowing women to, who have been in that sector to uh, better return to that sector is, uh, is crit of critical importance. But my perspective also was that uh, we can't just uh, support uh, women to return to that one particular sector, which is why there's this further uh, pot of funding available uh, to support women to return to other uh, sectors uh, as well. In terms of its value, it's there to support the same testbed approach to see what might actually work. So what we need to do is look at how effective the, the scheme that we've had running with Equate Scotland has been and any of the schemes that uh, we take forward as a result of this funding might be. Uh, learn uh, any lessons from that, see if it does require additional funding from the public purse or is it part of that wider discussion we have with employers to demonstrate uh, how those organisations who have taken part have benefited and to uh, explain to them why they might ben benefit too. Uh, to be fair, we're also uh, aware of, um, and not on a comprehensive basis, it's something else we're trying to assess, is that uh, there are already a number of employers that operate specific uh, return uh, ship uh, programmes themselves. So we need to look at that and see how effective they've been too. So there is work underway, there's more to be done, and then we need to see what's been effective, learn the lessons from that, and consider how we might uh, roll that out further. Thank you. And one just follow-up, if I may. The Scottish Business Pledge includes a pledge for equal pay. I understand the current number of businesses who, which have signed up is around 349, which is roughly one out of every thousand companies or businesses in Scotland. Do you have a plan to, uh, or a target for an increase in that sign-up rate so that over the, the next 12 or 24 months, you're looking for a higher number of businesses in Scotland to sign up to the, the Business Pledge? Yeah, of course we are. We, you know, it's um, it's uh, a pledge that is important to us. We want to see as many uh, take part as can. Uh, I suppose the point to make, of course, is uh, by its very nature, it's a voluntary scheme. 
We cannot compel uh, businesses uh, to take part in it. Uh, that requires some work for us to, to go out and uh, again get uh, companies involved as part of that uh, process. So, yes, certainly we want to see uh, more uh, take part. Um, those who sign up have to commit to uh, progress against all of the uh, individual strands that uh, comprise part of the uh, the, uh, the business pledge, uh, not all necessarily at the uh, same time. Uh, one of the uh, nine strands is uh, around action in terms of the gender pay gap, and um, uh, ultimately for those who have signed up to want to, to make sure that they are, are progressing against that uh, measure uh, as well. Um, we, in terms of the number of businesses who take part, uh, are ready to see that it is obviously a small subset of the uh, overall number of employers in Scotland. It's a fairly new uh, endeavour, it's a fairly new initiative. Uh, we uh, hope for it to uh, grow over time, I believe it will uh, grow over time. Uh, what we are uh, planning on doing is uh, assessing uh, how it's worked in practice so far, what uh, culture change it has led to. Uh, that will take place uh, this year and we'll be able to share the results of that with uh, this committee and other interested parties. Thank you. Thank you. And a question from Richard Leonard. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times already um, Scotland's labour market strategy, which you launched in August of last year, so that's been in place now for eight months or so. Um, one of the sections in the document included uh, a, a, an analysis of the, area, the kind of areas that we're looking at, uh, and I'll come on to one of those in particular in a minute, but, w but the, the, the final pledge in that area said that you were uh, intent on exploring wider pay-related issues, such as pay ratios, and transparency, and as you describe it, the negative impact of executive pay processes on investment, growth and productivity. Um, what action have you taken in those areas? Uh, so we've established the uh, strategic uh, group. It has met, um, uh, although we're still to absolutely bottom out uh, the membership. Uh, I'm sure Mr Leonard would uh, like to know it's on the basis that I think we need a uh, a bit more trade union membership on uh, that uh, group uh, than we've been able to secure thus far. Um, it, by its nature, it, uh, it's been fairly exploratory at this stage, um, uh, but that will be a critical element of the, the working group. It goes back to the, the point I've already made around the... Because uh, we can only explore those matters if we look at the relevant uh, data that we have uh, to, to assess the progress against the, the areas that you've set out, Mr Leonard. So, again, that will be a critical element of the, uh, the strategic labour market uh, group's work. Now, uh, I did undertake to, to write to the committee about that uh, group. Uh, I have not done so thus far, but I will be doing so as soon as possible. OK, thank you. One of the, uh, the other areas that um, is mentioned in that section is uh, something which we've returned to on uh, numerous occasions, and that is the living wage. Mm -hmm. And we heard evidence from the Fair Work Convention, for example, that that was a critical uh, instrument in addressing or beginning to address part of uh, the gender pay gap. And we heard again evidence this morning from Highlands and Isles Enterprise echoing that view. Um, uh, when I checked last night um, of the uh, listed accredited living wage employers, uh -huh. uh, there were just 468 uh, from the private sector out of a total of 793. Mm -hmm. um, do you not think you should be more proactive uh, in promoting uh, living wage accreditation? And do you think you should maybe have a word with Scottish Enterprise and Hiles and Isles Enterprise to encourage them to be more proactive in making the argument for uh, living wage accreditation? Well, I certainly feel I'm pretty proactive in this uh, regard, Mr Lend. I undertake a range of uh, visits to accredited living wage employers to uh, make sure that they are highlighted across a range of sectors, including the private sector, uh, to highlight that they've done so, to go back to the point we made about the, uh, the collaborative, inclusive economy very much on the same basis, because when we know that uh, those who are in the workforce are better remunerated, they're better motivated, feel more included, and will inevitably give more back to their uh, employer, making it a more uh, productive uh, workplace. Um, so uh, I think uh, it's uh, certainly an important part of our agenda uh, in terms of having set up the uh, accreditation uh, scheme. Uh, um, if you look at the, uh, 
the proportion of uh, those accredited across the UK uh, in Scotland, we comprise a significantly higher proportion than our population share would suggest we should. Uh, I know that the uh, Living Wage Foundation are very happy uh, with uh, the work that we're doing here in Scotland. We can also reflect on the fact that of the four uh, UK nations, we have the highest proportion of the work workforce paid at least uh, the living uh, wage. We can also uh, look at the work that we are undertaking as an administration to ensure that the living wage is paid in the uh, adult social care sector and also there has been an announcement around given we have got uh, ambitions to expand early years learning childcare, there is a, a pledge there to, to ensure that those working in the, uh, the, uh, the private third sector element of uh, early years childcare are also paid the living wage, clearly those in the public sector through local authorities already uh, are. So there's a range of work underway. Uh, I can assure you that uh, this, uh, the, uh, having set up and established the accreditation scheme, it's important for the Scottish Government to continue uh, to promote it. Uh, and uh, I think everyone in this uh, uh, Parliament has a role to play in that regard. Uh, everyone who's already signed up as an accredited living wage uh, employer has an important role to play that in that regard. Indeed, uh, I'll, um, uh, I won't uh, uh, name them, um, but. Uh, um, uh, not least if I'm can because I can't remember the name of the uh, particular company, which is most remiss of me. Um, but they're a law firm uh, based in uh, Glasgow who are an accredited living wage employer who undertook uh, to. Uh, and I'll write to the committee because, to be fair, this company deserves the, the credit for having uh, undertaken this uh, activity. Uh, they um, uh, arranged a, a seminar working with uh, their clients to do exactly as I've just said, spell out the benefits to them having become an accredited living wage employer. So the more organisations that can do that, whatever sector they may be in, the better. Just, just a, a very quick supplementary, because you mentioned childcare, and again yeah. in the strategy uh, you talk about an additional 20,000 jobs mm -hmm. uh, by 2020 yep. to provide the childcare we need. Yes. Uh, what progress have you made uh, in that regard? So we are uh, set out um, uh, the investment uh, that will be required to start to roll this out uh, in relation to uh, the uh, training that will be, need to be provided. Uh, we published that as part of uh, the, uh, uh, the budget process in December of last year. Uh, and again, we can provide that to the committee. That's the training element. Clearly, there needs to be capital investment as well. And we've set out uh, the, uh, the investment <coughs> required there too. Again, we can provide that to the committee. Um, thank you. And a follow-up question from Bill Bowman. Um, thank you, convener. Can before I ask my actual question, can I just go back to something you might have said earlier on? Uh, <laughs> well, um, we've had some um, difficulty or issues getting concrete examples as opposed to perhaps academic examples of benefits um, coming from you know, good gender pay uh, management. Um, and I think you said somewhere that there perhaps you had an example of a share price, at an increase. Um, arising from good gender pay activities. So if you were to be able to provide us with anything well, on that, that would be helpful. Y yes, I can. I, I, mean, I, should say, I should say my own perspective is that uh, academic examples uh, are still concrete uh, examples. M maybe um, uh, the, uh, you were suggesting that academic examples might be anecdotal. That's not no, the no, case. No, no, I was just meaning that we you know, go to a company and try and get a, an example. You can say this company did something and its bottom line or its um, staff turnover well, changed think, in a particular way. I think the information way. I have and we'll provide it relates to the Fortune 500, we can, uh, we can uh, provide that for you. Okay, thanks. Um, that, not that I want to distort m uh, market uh, behaviour, of course, uh, can be a, but if anyone has uh, stocks and shares, they may want to reflect on where they're investing it. Well, you're not a financial advisor, therefore. Nope. Shares go down as well as that. Well, uh, I'm, I'm aware of that. <laughs> I'm also not particularly much of a shareholder. But we can all look at each other's uh, declaration of interest, Mr Bowman. That's why they're declared. Yeah, indeed. Um, so going back to um, what John Mason was speaking about in terms of uh, the way some of the enterprise agencies were uh, dealing with the, the accounts they manage and um, how they manage the... Um, their accounts, treatment of gender pay issues. But could, could you give us a view as to whether you think the enterprise, agent, enterprise networks or agencies themselves should be scored on performance against promoting gender diversity with the companies they are supporting? 
So could you reiterate that, Mr Bowman, in the last part? So the enterprise networks themselves, um, we, we hope, are encouraging good gender pay mm -hmm. um, practices. Can we measure or can you measure and score their performance in doing that in some way to see how well they are so carrying would, that out? This would be in terms of the... Ra ra I mean, we could certainly... Uh, demonstrate their own individual performance going back to, I can't remember who asked the particular question in terms of their own individual performance and reducing their own uh, gender pay gap, that would be very straightforward in terms of those that they work Using with. Using it as a means of um, encouraging them from from your perspective to... In ter terms of encouraging those uh, the, the employees enterprise that they agencies with. themselves, yes. Sorry, just to clarify again, you're talking about with the, the employers that they seek to engage with rather than their own performance? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I suspect uh, we'd need to look at that in terms of the information uh, they gather. Uh, one of the issues around that would uh, be what uh, might be reported going forward in terms of the statutory requirement that has been, now been established by the UK government. Uh, that will only capture some of the information, but uh, certainly we can reflect on that and see uh, how that might be able to be achieved. And Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the kind of things you're considering, perhaps not concretely at the moment, but considering to tackle the gender pay gap and, 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 uh, and reduce it. And I'm thinking particularly the two initiatives you have already, the Scottish Business Pledge and the Fair Work Framework. We heard evidence from Close the Gap that there's no evidence that the Scottish Business Pledge has changed employer practice on equal pay. Um, the gender equality element of the pledge describes achieving a balanced workforce Close the gap's not aware of this indicator being used anywhere else in the world and regard it as meaningless. Um, as to the Fair Work Framework, um, they say that the Fair Work Framework, the focus on women's experience of the labour market and what Fair Work means for women is minimal and difficult to see how the framework in its current form will enable employers to operationalise Fair Work for women in Scotland. Um, I'm just wondering if you think those, those uh, comments are, are fair comments and what else you're considering doing in order to reduce the gender pay gap. I think uh, the assessment of the... Uh, the commitment within the, uh, the business pledge is meaningless would be uh, unfair in terms of how we demonstrate how meaningful... I don't think they're saying the commitment's meaningless. I think they're, they're, they're specifically talking about the, um, the, the, the measure, the fact that it's about a balanced workforce. Uh -huh. That's meaningless in, 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 in terms of the headline workforce numbers because uh -huh. it doesn't do anything actually to reveal or tackle gender pay gap as such. It, no, I suppose in of itself it might not be felt to, although um, it, inherent within that, I think, if I remember correctly, within the pledge, it's about, it's got to be a meaningful uh, uh, effort at a balanced workforce. So it can't just be saying that the, you know 50% of the workforce is female, 50% is men. It's got to be across the different levels of the workforce, which we do know can uh, have an impact in terms of the, the gender pay gap. I think uh, the committee's probably gathered enough evidence to suggest that would be the case. In terms of measuring its effectiveness, I suppose I would go back to the point that I've just made that we are seeking to measure the impact of the business pledge and that will be taken forward this year. Um, so that will begin to um, uh, allow us to draw out how, what the difference it is, uh, it's uh, making uh, uh, on the ground. Uh, and again, uh, because it's a voluntary, by its very nature, by the nature of the powers we have as a as a partner, as an administration, it's a voluntary uh, scheme. Um, so it's a it's about a, a system of progression. Uh, the, uh, when you sign up to that pledge, you uh, commit to progressing against all uh, of the uh, its requirements. Not necessarily all simultaneously; they're all at the same time. So uh, again, this change might uh, happen over a uh, a longer period uh, of time, but. Uh, Clearly, we need to, to measure that, and that's something we're committed to doing, and uh, I've already committed to that we can make that information readily available for the consumption of this committee and others who have uh, an interest in it. In terms of the, the Fair Work framework, um, I think I'm right in saying that uh, um, you had uh, evidence from uh, one of the co-chairs that uh, refuted uh, that uh, perspective, and uh, they feel that they are taking this uh, area seriously. Uh, I think one of the strengths of uh, the, uh, the framework and the convention itself is that although it's uh, a body that we established 
uh, as a critical element of our commitment to fair work. And uh, uh, although it's a body that we provide uh, funding for, uh, it's, uh, it's able to set its own uh, priorities, its own uh, agenda, uh, say, uh, allowing it then to, to, to challenge us as an administration. Um, uh, so ultimately, that would be for something that the, the Convention would need to reflect on now. I uh, have already committed to reflecting on the, the findings, the recommendations of uh, this uh, committee as a result of this inquiry. My expectation would be, and I'd be surprised if they didn't, would be that the, the Convention would do likewise. And in terms of anything else the Scottish Government is considering doing in this area, do you have any... Uh, well, we're undertaking, in terms of closing the gender pay yep, gap indeed. overall, well, uh, we're undertaking, a, I think, a, a range of activity. Some of it is a, a longer-term process. Uh, ultimately, we need to recognise that I think the, the gender pay gap is uh, symptomatic of um, cultural and attitudinal uh, issues, that uh, assumptions around what we expect of women and men in uh, not just the workplace but in society, which then has an impact on uh, how they uh, how they feature in, in the labour market. That is a process that starts on very early in a person's uh, life. So, through uh, the work that we want to take through uh, early uh, uh, years um, uh, activity, through the development of young workforce uh, arrangements, through uh, our commitment to. Uh, doing rather better in terms of uh, uh, gender equality in our modern apprenticeship frameworks through the Scottish Funding Council's Gender Action Plan. Uh, these are approaches that we want to, uh, to take to break down some of those uh, structural barriers that arise out of the, the assumptions that we uh, that uh, are probably ingrained in, uh, in all of us, everyone around this table probably, even though we are all determined to tackle the gender pay gap, even we will be susceptible to some of those assumptions uh, because they are so ingrained in our uh, society. So we need to try and wind some of that uh, back. And over the longer term, I believe that can make a difference. In terms of the immediate term, I've already laid out some of the work that we're undertaking in terms of returnerships, in terms of encouraging um, uh, more women to be involved in entrepreneurial uh, activity and some of the practical measures we're taking in terms of promoting the living wage. We know that uh, those who benefit by payment of the living wage are um, uh, there'll be more women than men benefiting because more women happen to be in low paid work at this uh, time that's clearly a longer term uh, challenge for us so uh, there are things that we're taking in the here and now and there are also things that we're undertaking to try and uh, deal with this over the longer term and you mentioned earlier i think um or you noted that the committee had heard some evidence about the potential value of a national strategy to tackle a gender Pay gap. I think yep. you said you had an open mind on that. You may not wish to add anything to those previous comments just now, but it seems clear from what you've said that there are a number of areas of government policy, mm -hmm. not just at Scottish level, but UK level, that need to be joined up mm -hmm. in order to tackle this in the long term. Yeah, I, my, my perspective is that the work we're undertaking isn't necessarily that disjointed, but if um, there is a, a view from this uh, committee inquiry that there is more to to be done in terms of better joining up, then clearly it's incumbent on me to, to reflect on that and either agree with it or disagree with it. So I'm not going to commit to, to the here and now to uh, such uh, uh, an approach, but uh, I'm very open-minded to, to considering it. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, thank you very much, Minister, for coming in today. And um, I'll suspend this uh, session to move to private session, allow um, we'll reconvene for a private session at 10 past 12. Thank you very much.